There's a couple different ones that are specific to open on demand and then um, in depth we'll go into a little bit more about the parameters required for open on demand applications um, and those specifically for Open Refine, Agilock Metashape, RStudio, and Jupyter Notebook. So what is the FSU Research Computing Center? We're a unit of FSU IT department. Um, we used to be part of scientific computing, um, the department on the fourth floor of Dirac. And we um, host and maintain the supercomputer, um, which is located on, on Innovation Park campus. Um, and that's our high performance computer. So high performance computing utilizes both specialized hardware, um, so basically just a souped up version of an average home computer, um, has a bunch of different uh, Intel AMD processors, whereas your computer will only have one or the other. Um, and then you can do a more custom build of um, the hardware as opposed to, say, like a laptop or a computer at home. You can also offload your work, so that way if you have a, um, a very like heavy load um, program on your system, you don't necessarily have to use that and keep that on for the majority of your program. You can just uh, use our computer, but then also use your own personal computer uh, to do whatever else you need to do. And you don't have to be um, waiting for your program to finish to then use your stuff. Um, it allows you to also use parallel processes um, as there's a bunch of different ways of utilizing high performance computing. You can either think of it as a um, very large high powered computer or you can think of it as multiple computers all tied together to run your program. Um, this also allows you to repeat tasks over and over again without uh, like holding up your own computer to do other tasks like checking email or um, preparing other materials. So to jump into uh, data humanities or digital humanities, um, these are a bunch of different uh, applications of what data humanities is. You can apply digital methods to humanities research, or you can study like the, the critique of um, the digital world um, in, under the guise of humanities dif disciplines or a combination of both. So um, you'll see a bunch of different uh, interfaces, institutions, um, like structures that uh, employ data humanities um, that we want to incorporate um, in the interdisciplinary data humanities initiative. So why combine digital humanities and HPC support? Well, there's a lot of big data that sometimes there's not a really good place to host it in either data humanities or digital humanities. Um, there are a great many digital collections that have the same issue of hosting. Um, you can employ um, machine learning and artificial intelligence to uh, the collections of data. And um, so uh, again, in the case of like big data, there's some file size limitations that you might not be able to access them on your own computers, but you will be able to access them on a high performance computer. And then of course, classroom tech, if you're not um, interested in using anything like Google Drive to share those resources, um, and then also having multiple high-powered devices uh, for your classroom that you can use um, and utilize those resources uh, without having to start up a bunch of different things um, or create um, a system yourself. So for Interdisciplinary Data Humanities Initiative, this is a um, this is an organization underneath the Research Computing Center that uh, allows for digital humanities projects to um, be combined with high performance computing. So the purpose is to not only encourage like the humanities, social sciences, and arts within high performance computing system, specifically our high performance computing system, but also um, to allow for digital humanities projects like these um, that require bigger resources than what's uh, typically uh, available on your personal laptop or desktop. And then also um, to um, spread the education of what high performance computing is to people that are interested in digital humanities that come from 
a humanities only background um, and then can therefore influence the rest of a curriculum in the humanities so that they know some computing as well. So there's three different components of IDHI and these are similar to the components that we have at the Research Computing Center. We have specialized software specifically for digital humanities. We have research support where we can consult on large projects that are hosted on our system and then they can further serve as models um, for future work. And then we also provide uh, workshops and class services for teaching resources um, with the use of any digital humanities software, um, also additionally the ones that are hosted on our systems like OpenRefine or ExistDB. Um, and then if anyone is interested or curious in chat, we can also talk about all the different um, teaching resources that we have already provided for this. We, I think, um, were established last year and have had more than 15 workshops, um, either in class or outside of class, um, in regards to IDHI or data humanities. So um, that's a lot of information. I'm going to pause for questions to see if anyone has any que like have any questions or concerns about um, interdisciplinary data humanities initiative or the research computing center um, before we jump into open on demand. Okay. Okay, so um, this is, these are the instructions to get onto Open On Demand. Um, for in-person attendees, we have um, sign-in sheets that have a workshop username and password um, with the same QR code that you can scan or click uh, or type in the tiny URL um, for the instructions to get to Open On Demand, and these are what our basic instructions will be. Um, you can utilize these if you have an RCC account. The Slurm account might change if you already have an RCC account. Um, so I'll just make notes of that as we go through. Uh, but otherwise, feel free to um, follow along and um, you can scan this on your phone and it will provide the same information that would if you were to type in the tiny URL. Uh, and here's some of those instructions. Uh, we'll, the essential process is um, make sure that you're on the off-campus VPN if you are off-campus. Um, but if you're on-campus, you can just go directly to uh, ood.rcc.fsu.edu, and then you can use either your RCC credentials or the temporary workshop account credentials that we've provided. So, to explain the general HPC workflow, if you're unfamiliar, you haven't been to any of our other workshops. Um, first, you start here at your, um, at your own personal computer. And once you log into od.rcc.fsu.edu, you will be on our interface for Open On Demand. Um, from there, you can use any of the Open On Demand applications, and you will be slotted into the Slurm job scheduler. And I'll get to that in a second, but basically it allows you to allocate specific resources and time um, so that you can run any of those applications with the right amount of memory that you need, the right amount of time that you need, and in the right um, like allocated space uh, given the permissions on your account. Uh, once you do that, the Open On Demand application will actually run on the cluster itself I'm using one of our many HPC nodes. And um, while it's running, you can see those results interactively on Open On Demand, and that's what this get output arrow does. And then you can then download all of that information onto your PC if you want to use it, or you can use that output specifically on Open On Demand itself. And I'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, are there any questions about this workflow? We've done this slightly in different ways for intro to HPC class and then our intro to Linux class. Um, but this is the general HPC workflow specifically for Open On Demand. Okay, any questions? Okay. 
Um, and uh, for those of you online, I have Alex Townsend um, moderating. I'm sure he's already typed multiple things in chat. So if you have any questions, um, he'll let me know and I can answer them um, either verbally or he can type in to chat um, the answer if I'm in the middle of a thought or anything like that. Um, so feel free to ask questions at any point. So um, something to keep in mind uh, for the Slurm job scheduler, uh, we're going to talk a lot about memory, cores, and nodes. So the HPC nodes contain many cores. If you want to think about it in this way, or at least this is how I think about it, multiple nodes um, are useful for parallel programming, which means like multiple computers doing different tasks, but they're both working in tandem to complete the same program. Um, versus single nodes uh, will do serial programming, which means um, similar to running one single code on your computer, um, and that's doing all of the tasks sequentially like a recipe or something. So like it would be step one, then step two, then step three, as opposed to doing them in tandem of like chopping all of the vegetables, um, which doesn't rely on each other. So the Slurm job scheduler, you have to specify how much memory you want to use. Um, and the default is when you specify cores, it will automatically give you two gigabytes per core if you don't specify the amount of memory. Um, and this, of course, depends on that um, queue or partition, the Slurm account that you're um, able to use and you have permission to use. Um, so that changes uh, based on that. And um, the wait time for your job will increase if you ask for a lot of memory. So this is a little bit of a balancing act. And that's something that we do at the Research Computing Center as well, is helping you create that balance of getting your job done at a fast enough time but also making sure that you're not waiting very long. As the Research Computing Center is a shared resource, there will be some wait time, give or take, depending on the um, Slurm account that you're using. So, um, so what are Slurm accounts? Uh, I mentioned them, at in, and they fit in terms of the Slurm job scheduler. It's basically just saying, like, this is my allocated uh, space that I can request resources. And these are the ones that are available if you are general access. So that means that if your faculty sponsor doesn't have any additional resources that they've paid for, um, these are the ones that are generally available for any user that has a free RCC account. Um, there's Gen Ac Q, which is our general access queue, um, Backfill, Backfill 2, Condor, and Quick Test. And the next slide talks a little bit about why you would pick each different one. But as you can see, they have different um, space allocations. So the general access queue, Gen Act queue, has 14 days of default runtime and has a 14 day max runtime, but the backfill only has four hours. So they have different nodes available per Slurm account. Um, this max CPU cores per job and max jobs per user um, it looks like a lot, but um, on occasion we'll have um, a large number of CPU cores uh, used depending on the job that you're running. Um, and this can either be non-interactively or interactively. For open on demand, uh, they tend to be very interactive uh, jobs. And then um, as this is a shared resource, we do have a limit on the number of running jobs that you can have that we can have per user. Um, so that we don't have one user that's taking up all of the resources and we can um, fairly share this resource among many people. Oh, okay, um, so uh, I talk a little bit more about the Slurm account, um, the Slurm account usage and why you would use a given resource um, or a given Slurm account uh, later on as we go through, but those are something to keep in mind. The memory cores nodes and the Slurm accounts um, are something that are required for every single open on-demand application um, as we go through. So, um, if you have an RCC account and you are following along virtually, um, this is what your open on-demand dashboard will be. Uh, when you are able to log in. Uh, so we have the tabs up on the top. Um, 
And as you can see from the screenshot, I'm logged in as Workshop 54. So if you have a Workshop account or have used a Workshop account, this is what it'll look like. It'll look slightly different if you have an RCC account. Um, but this is generally where our RCC news is in the, the main page of our dashboard. And then I'll actually go through each and every single one of these tabs and talk through what's happening in them. So um, first is the apps tab, followed by the jobs or files, jobs, clusters, interactive apps, and my interactive sessions. Um, so, so there's a little bit of a duplication in terms of the content for apps and interactive apps. So I'll focus mostly on interactive apps. Um, and we'll go through them like that. So um, I guess before I move on, um, there's a lot of like overview stuff that I've covered also. Are there any questions on that? OK. Um, so to start off with the files, uh, I'll actually go into the dashboard itself and then um, go into files. So you'll see here that it drops down into home directory. Um, and if that's too small, let Alex know and I'll zoom in. Um, maybe. So if I click on home directory, um, it should bring me to a file explorer very similar to file explorer on Windows, where it has all the folders uh, marked with the yellow folder. And then um, for files, it will have um, a gray. Uh, it'll have a gray box. So, as we click into these, um, this is a very uh, bare bones version since it is a workshop account. Um, but you'll be able to click through things as you would be able to on your personal computer. Um, there's a lot of different options here uh, for files that you can do. So if you have this config.py here, you can view, edit, rename, download, delete. Um, there are different options. So you can also, if you check this box, you can open, um, you can open this whole section in the terminal, or you can open specific files in the terminal. You can create new files or new directories. Um, you can upload files from your computer onto the HPC, and then you can also download files um, slash folders from the HPC to your personal computer. And then if you want to move things around on here, you can copy and move files to different folders. Um, and then, of course, you can delete it. So the thing about open on demand is it allows you to have multiple different ways of accessing the same set of information. So as we go through, you'll kind of see this file explorer represented in different ways, um, but it's all accessing the same space in the system. Let's see, is there anything else that I cover? OK, so that's it for files. Um, you can change a directory specifically if you know where you want to go. Um, and then it should automatically change on here, or you can kind of click through um, the spaces that you want to be in. Um, this arrow will allow you to go up one theoretically um, if you're not already in your home directory. Oops. OK, so um, yeah, and you can uh, actually see everyone's home directory, but you can't access everyone's home directory. So to jump back into this. Um, I've covered everything, I think, except for editing files. So if we go back to um, my home directory, which you can either do it by typing in the actual address, or you can go back here and click home directory, and that'll slot you back into your home directory. Um, if I wanted to edit these, this file in particular, and this is very small, um, but uh, you can go in and you can actually edit it. And then there's a Save button here. And when you save it, you can go back, and it'll be that changed version. So it'll have the new modified date. Um, the same thing can be done if you want to view the file only. It'll look kind of similar, but um, you won't be able to access it. So those are two different buttons. OK, so um, the Jobs tab. So that's uh, right here. And if you click on it, you have two different options, theoretically, when it loads. Um, 
So you have active jobs and job composer. Um, okay, so if you click on active jobs, you can see essentially everyone's job that is currently running um, on every single account. So basically an entire overview of what's happening on the HPC. If you are in fact waiting uh, to run any of your applications on uh, general access, you can actually filter by general access queue and you can see um, what jobs have been completed on there recently, um, if there are any jobs that are queued and also waiting for resources, and then currently how many jobs are running on there. Um, it doesn't tell you a lot about these jobs, it only tells you the time that's used up on the system, um, and then who is in fact utilizing the system. So as you can see, we have three pages of people using general access at this current moment. Um, and good thing it has a lot of nodes, so we can still have people running it, um, and there are a couple people waiting on their job usage. Um, if you click down, you can also see um, a little bit of the resources that they use. So for this particular job, it's using three different nodes and it's asking for 48 CPUs um, and that's something that's specific to that code. Um, and so you can check on this as well for your personal jobs. Um, so if you switch over to your jobs, I currently don't have any jobs running, um, but they should populate here and you can either do this for um, the open on demand applications that you're running or if you're running any jobs um, non-interactively. Uh, the other thing here is Job Composer, and this is something that we cover a little bit more in our Intro to HPC uh, workshop, um, and it talks about uh, specifically like how to submit a, a submission script and all of the different parameters that um, are automatically displayed for you in fill-out boxes for Open On Demand. Um, but if you're interested, let us know. We have a lot of documentation on this as well on our website, docs at rcc.fsu.edu. Um, so this is just to let you know that this is here as an option if you want to run more non-interactive jobs. So active jobs and then job composer. So cluster um, is right here, and if you click on HPC shell access, you'll see something very similar to a command line or a terminal, and that's because that's what it is. Um, it is essentially a terminal access to um, the HPC that you just log into o open on demand, and you don't need anything like PuTTY or um, a terminal button on your own computer. You can just access it via um, the browser. If I type in ls, that'll show exactly the same set of files that's on my home directory. Um, and that's a, another way for you to tell that this is the same system that we can access via files. Um, I actually, on this slide, I display what shows up when you're first creating an account, or once you first create an account, it'll ask you for um, the fingerprint um, for access for authenticity, and then it'll also act ask you for your password again. Um, the cursor itself won't move, but when you enter your password, it is recording every keystroke that you use. Um, so make sure that you're typing it as correct as possible. If you press enter and it doesn't work, that's just because you've entered it incorrectly. Um, but typically when you log in after this first initial spot, it will show up with this um, extra text of welcome to the RCC, and then this, um, your username and what uh, login node you are accessing. Uh, okay, so I'm going to jump into specific interactive applications on Open On Demand. Are there any questions online? Yeah. Um, roughly, how much space do you get on your home directory? On your home directory, you get uh, 150, ter uh, 150 gigabytes um, for free, and then you can kind of ask for more in a shared space. Um, outside of those 150 gigabytes. But it tends to be just enough space, um, or a lot of space, to house uh, a lot of data and files. Yeah, of course. Any other questions? No? 
Okay. All right. So, um, so for interactive applications, I'll just uh, kind of review those um, the Slurm accounts information as well as the um, the memory nodes and cores from our previous um, our previous slides, and then I'll go into specifically all of the application or most of the applications that we have specifically for digital humanities. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about what my interactive applications does. So, um, for each of the tabs that we saw, we didn't have any parameters that we had to enter um, to use resources from the HPC. Um, for the interactive applications, we do have to specify these resources before we actually use them on, on the high performance computer. Uh, this is a very narrowed down version of the um, parameters that will typically be asked for for each application. Um, there are more than this in some of the applications that we'll talk about today. Um, so specifically, you'll need the Slurm account, the number of hours that you'll be using it, um, the amount of memory, nodes, and cores that you need for your job, and then also whether or not you'll be using a GPU, and this is how many uh, you'll be using. Um, in terms of your job. So um, we have this note specifically on each uh, parameter that require or that um, specifies GPUs. If you do specify a GPU, it may take longer for your job to start. So if your program doesn't uh, absolutely require it, we recommend that you don't um, specify it if you don't need it. So uh, this is again the same. Something to consider, um, most of our interactive applications are gonna be single node processing, um, and there'll be a helpful note at the bottom of it to say that uh, if it's not asking for nodes, then it'll be specifically on one node, um, and then if it is asking for nodes, that typically you're allotted one node. Um, something to consider is that when you're requesting specific number of cores, you can always leave the memory blank because it will give you and allocate you a specific number of memory based on this requirement, the default. Um, but again, uh, when you request memory and cores, it will always give you the amount of memory even if it is over the core count that you request. And then this is that same general access Slurm accounts that all of our RCC users get um, just for free. Um, and this is our standard, uh, standard access. So um, in terms of what to use when, um, quick test is for when you have um, a less than 10 minute test. If you wanna make sure that your code is running and won't immediately error out, then I would use quick test. Um, backfill and backfill 2 um, will allow you to use um, higher powered and newer nodes than general access because we have a lot of um, nodes in general access um, and this specifically mentions if your job can be preempted early so backfill and backfill 2 share with our owner slurm accounts which means that if an owner account starts their job um, your your personal interactive job can be preempted or stopped because they've decided to use that, uh, that node. Um, if it needs uh, inter-node communication, so that multiple node usage via MPI or OpenMP, you can sit, consider using Condor or General Access Queue. And then, um, like I mentioned before, with the owner partitions or the owner Slurm accounts, um, if your lab or research professor has purchased HPC resources, then um, you will be enrolled in those um, specific resources as well, and you'll have additional Slurm accounts that you can utilize. So, um, to jump into OpenRefine, um, here are our recommended parameters for OpenRefine. Um, OpenRefine is typic typically used um, for digital humanities um, viewing and uh, sorting large CSV files. Um, so in this case, if you have a workshop account or if you have your own RCC account, you can use the general access queue um, and then a request for 16 gigabytes of memory. 
you have to specify the G at the end or it would automatically give you 16 megabytes, which is not enough to run this program. And then um, you can leave the number of cores blank because it will just allocate the number of cores necessary to get to 16 gigabytes. Um, so for example, if I were to go under here, under interactive apps, and go and click on open or fine, it will give me um, this parameter list and I can go in and change these values um, if necessary. So if I were to leave this one blank, number of cores, and request for 16 gigs, um, I can click launch. And then it'll be queued initially. Um, and so once the job is available and once the resources have been freed up to use this application on the high performance computer, um, a button will populate at the bottom that says um, connect to OpenRefine or launch OpenRefine. And from there, we can use OpenRefine on the HPC. Um, as the time requested was one hour, as this goes on and the job has been started, it will decrease in time until it completes and grays out like this, um, like this card at the bottom. So it also keeps a record of the jobs that have run before the applications that I've run before. Um, and then you can either remove the session if you're done with it um, before time, or you can um, retain it here to see all of the, the recent jobs that you've completed. So um, once this happens, it'll change from a blue queued bar to a running bar, and it'll tell you what the resources that have been allocated to this. So, for example, this is running open or fine with one node and five cores. And it's running on uh, this particular node, uh, D36-5-3. And so as you can see, it started with one hour and now the time remaining is 59 minutes. I can close this tab and come back to it any time between now and 59 minutes and I'll still be able to access that same um, thing. So it's very different from when you are closing a tab on your computer, like that job is no longer running anymore, right? Like that tab is not running anymore. And when you um, open a new tab, it'll not come back the same way that you had it before. But when you launch OpenRefine um, and you are accessing different things, if you close this window and click launch again, it'll be the same uh, setup that you originally had um, when you closed it. So um, something to keep in mind also is that um, there are, they have the specific name of the, um, the application that you're running for each of these tabs. So if you're running multiple at the same time, you can know exactly which card is running which application and you can come back to it. Um, as you saw, there's a max number of jobs per user, so you can run multiple applications and that will count as multiple jobs. So, what are our use cases for OpenRefine? Oops. Um, our use cases are large data sets. Um, they can be CSV, um, Excel sheets, JSON. Um, you can do a lot of things with this uh, that you wouldn't be able to do with Excel. So like sorting, filtering, um, specific facets. Um, and we go into a little bit more depth of what is happening in OpenRefine. Um, in our Intro to IDHI workshop, which I don't know when the next time we'll host it, but we did host it last year. Um, this is really helpful if you have an extremely large data set that actually can't be viewable from Excel, you can open it in here. Um, and this kind of limits the view, but you can kind of sort through all of the different uh, records in this. Um, and you can do a lot of things with it. Um, so, uh, so MetaShape is slightly different from OpenRefine. When you go onto interactive apps, you don't see Agisoft MetaShape listed in here at all. Um, so what we do for this is we go to desktop um, and we have specific um, parameters requested for this. So what we'll do is we'll leave this amount of memory blank, number of nodes one, number of cores 16. Um, our Slurm account is general access queue and then uh, the number of hours is one, just for testing purposes. Uh, this box in the bottom is helpful for when you have your own RCC account. So 
in case there's a, if you're requesting for a lot of um, allocated resources, you can click this box and it'll send you an email when the session start, starts. And so that way you can come back to it and you don't have to have this tab open um, the entire time that you're waiting for a job to start. As I'm using a workshop account, it won't send me an email. It'll send a workshop account an email, which I don't have access to. So when we go to launch desktop, it'll start the same way as the OpenRefine. As you can see here, the OpenRefine application is still running and it's got 56 minutes remaining. Um, when we start up desktop, it'll say the starting thing, um, which you can see there's no launch button yet. Um, so we can't actually access the desktop, but um, once that shows up, we can click on it. And it's very similar to uh, how you have your own desktop where there's a lot of icons um, visible and you can uh, click through things. So for example, when we were looking at our file explorer before, we can click on the home page and it shows a similar file explorer of the same set of information. So Jupyter environment, on demand, R, um, config.py. And so again, same thing with the files tab, we can click on this and we can see and edit this content and it will change also in our files tab because this is accessing the same set of information. Um, it just is a different way of accessing the same stuff. So for Agisoft Metashape, what you can do is you can run this, um, load the module, Um, so since this is a workshop account, uh, it won't allow you to access the Metashape software. Um, you'll need access to a particular group, which I mentioned in the slides. Um, you would have to join the IDHI Compute group, um, but for this demo, um, general access queue is fine. Uh, when you are on this system, you can open any other software that you have on here that requires um, interacting with, so any clicking uh, that you wouldn't necessarily interact with on the command line or the terminal. Uh, and yeah, this is the, I believe you can also access the internet this way as well, as long as you load the module load, module web proxy. Um, but it is, again, very similar. So you have the tabs of the different windows that are open here. Um, you can access the terminal. Uh, the specific use cases um, for desktop are any program that has a graphical user interface, like I said, um, like if you need to click anything with a mouse. Um, if it doesn't have a specific app on Open On Demand, um, you can already start using it on the desktop as opposed to wait, waiting for us to install a specific application on Open On Demand. And then if you want all of the windows for the HPC in the same tab. So if you want File Explorer and the command line and um, like any of the applications, so if you want it all in one window, one tab that you can access um, and you know that it's all contained in one space, uh, the desktop is really the best application for that. Where um, I know that sometimes when I'm using the command line on my computer, to access the HPC as opposed to using Intro to Open On Demand, I can get kind of confused about what files are where, whether they're on my personal computer or on the HPC. So this kind of contains it all in one space. So um, the last two examples of applications for um, Open On Demand are Jupyter Notebook and RStudio, and this is used by both digital humanists and um, anyone in the STEM field, and these are for Python code and R code respectively. So the, um, the, param the recommended parameters um, are listed here on this other side. Uh, the thing that's different from the desktop application or the open or fine one is that you have to specify which Python version you'd like. Um, Python 3 we recommend um, because that's just base what we have 3.8. Um, and then also a path to your Jupyter virtual environment. Um, here it explains a little bit about 
why we need you to specify your virtual environment. And if you do specify it and it's not installed yet, um, it will be created for you. It just takes a little bit of time in terms of startup. Um, and then these parameters are very similar. So if we go back to this and go to Interactive Apps and Jupyter Notebooks, um, as you can see, mine are all pre-populated. And this is pre-populated not with the recommended parameters that we specify, but with whatever has been typed in last. So if you've typed in something and it hasn't worked and you've gone back to the screen, um, if you try and run it again, it mm, will not work again. Um, so when you click on launch, it'll give you that same process um, where the uh, application is queued and then you have the rest of your running jobs here. Um, and then if you're familiar with Jupyter Notebook, it's the same setup where when you open up Jupyter Notebook, it'll show the file directory um, of Jupyter Notebooks and you're also able to create new Jupyter Notebooks um, as well. So this is helpful and I think the best use case for this is if you are developing code, if you want a space to both utilize the plots, um, the Python code and the documentation all in one space. And additionally, um, if you're doing a Python code in development, because this code isn't necessarily run sequentially in a Jupyter Notebook, you have to select which chunk you'll run. Um, and so if you're testing a bunch of different ways that you want to implement your Python code, uh, Jupyter Notebook is your best bet because you don't necessarily have to run things like one after the other, like a Python script. You can just do um, the third block of code first or like the second block of code third, that kind of stuff. And you can shift around the order. So, um, uh, I will say as this is loading that uh, we do offer a Python bootcamp, which is a full day of introduction to Python workshops and we're offer, we offer it every spring. So we will be offering this workshop in spring 2024. If you're interested, keep an eye out for that. Um, and this is our desktop, so we can exit out of this. And once we go to connect to Jupyter, we can then see um, the same file explorer um, you can create a new Python 3 notebook. And it displays here with a code block, untitled, um, and you'll be able to see it now here as an active Python Jupyter notebook. So yeah, and then for our studio, um, for this one, instead of specifying your Python version, R Studio requires you to specify your R version. Um, and then the, uh, the parameters are very similar. Um, the parameters that we show in these uh, slides are all for the majority. They work for the majority of the cases. Um, and then once you click launch, um, you'll, you should be able to see um, an R Studio window, so if you're familiar with running it on your own computer, this essentially has multiple windows to give you different information about R. So you can have your coding block, um, your terminal slash console, so anything that you would typically see on the command line. Uh, you have your history of commands in one of the windows and then also a mini file explorer. Um, so as you can see, I'm, I'm running multiple jobs at this point and nothing is crashed and nothing is um, messed up. If I go back to open refine, it's the same as when I left it. Um, and if I wanted to, I could remove open refine if I no longer needed this application while it's running. Um, because I have other jobs that I'd like to run, I can just delete this session. And once I delete it, I can no longer return to that open refine window, I would have to start up another interactive app. Um, so um, some things to note, uh, this view actually of all of the uh, jobs that I'm currently running is what you will see when you click on my interactive sessions. As you can see, it doesn't really change because these are all of my interactive sessions that are running. And you can also see this when you go to jobs, active jobs, 
these are all of the different jobs that I'm running. And this completed one is the open refine that I've closed. Um, and you can see that also from the name of the job here. So um, we go back to my interactive sessions. Um, there's a, a couple different things on the cards themselves that are important. So um, the session ID will take you to um, a bunch of scripts. And these are uh, particularly helpful if you're having issues or if you're running into like the display looks funky. Um, this session ID will help uh, RCC support staff let you know what exactly is happening with your code or what exactly is happening with this particular um, job. And we can kind of reference this as uh, more documentation. Uh, the other thing for these cards are, is the view, view only shareable link. So if you are able to um, get to the tech support um, for RCC and you're encountering an issue Instead of sending us a screenshot, you can share this view only shareable link. Um, and what this allows you to do is you can see exactly what the user is experiencing without having to be over someone's shoulder um, looking over what they're doing. So this uh, is very helpful for us when we have um, virtual one-on-ones to see um, what's happening on your screen as opposed to sharing screen or whatnot. Um, so from this, as you can see, I can't click on anything because this is a view only link. So this is something that you can provide if you need any tech support for open on demand. Um, and then I guess lastly, we'll just show, so this is what um, our studio looks like. And there's a bunch of different windows of different um, information. And this is super helpful if you just need a bird's eye view of the code that you're working on. Um, if you enter a lot of commands in the console, these will display on history. Um, and then if you're running specific scripts on here, these will also display on history as well. And then this, again, is that files, same files tab, same set of files um, here. And then if, you, um, if you're using packages on our studio, these are the packages that um, are installed on your particular system. So um, I think that's it for open on demand in terms of the content that I wanted to cover today. We recommend using RStudio 2023 as it is older, but we have retained RStudio server in case you want to use an older version of RStudio. Um, and both of these will work with uh, the current versions of R that we have on the HPC system. And these are duplicated. OK, so um, let's see. View only, session ID, and then yes. So um, lastly, I'll mention that you can sign up for an RCC account, um, as most of our attendees for this workshop session are um, virtual. Um, if you're a faculty, you can automatically sign up for an RCC account. Um, if you're not faculty, so if you are a student or staff, make sure that you have a faculty sponsor for your account and make sure that you've talked to your faculty sponsor before you've um, requested them on, um, on the RCC uh, interface, as we've had some difficulties with that in the past. If you have any questions on our documentation, um, it's located at docs.rcc.fsu.edu if you have an RCC account. And if you'd like to get started, um, and have questions on that. We also have some getting started documentation there as well. Um, if you have any questions that aren't covered in docs.rcc.fsu.edu um, or in this talk that we've had right now, um, you can email us at support at rcc.fsu.edu um, for any of those concerns. And I know I've covered a lot of information um, as we always do in these sessions. So if you have any questions, please let me know. Um, and outside of that, uh, that's it. Thank you guys for coming. Any questions?
Are you typing? Um, if, so like for edge self-management, if I want to be part of the IDHI group, is that limited to certain people, or can I just request to be part of send like a ticket and request to be part of the five account? Yeah, so you can request to be a part of the IDHI compute. Um, if you're interested in having um, access to Agisoft Metashape, as we do have a standard license. Um, I think I briefly went over that just because I had previously taught a Photogrammetry Institute seminar where the entire thing was how do you access Metashape on um, the RCC, but it is a 3D modeling software for photogrammetry for those that are unaware. Um, we have a couple different versions. The professional version is just a demo, but for the standard, we do have a license for it. So if you're interested in using the standard license, I would again just um, send an email to support and then we'll, we'll enroll you in that group. Yeah. So if there's like another like the DH software that I want to use that's not, that's not on that interactive apps, can I request to have it installed or will you all help me install it? Yeah, um, so we are more than happy to install any um, digital humanities related software on the HPC system. Um, just again, send us a ticket or an email at support at rcc.fcu.edu and we'll help you get started on that. Any other questions? When you said um, you do in, When you said you do um, in, like in class workshops, how does that work? Is it like is it on a separate venue or is it in the or is it in the classroom itself? Yeah, so we actually have done. Let me see if I can pull up the slides. Um, so we have done um, in class workshops for specific professors that have required uh, digital humanities uh, workshops. And we've also, I think, done at least once a semester a digital humanities uh, workshop um, hosted by the RCC. Um, we had a form circulate uh, at the beginning of this semester uh, talking about any uh, classroom support needs or consultations that you would require. Um, so uh, again, if you have questions about that, we can uh, answer those at support. Um, at rcc.fsu.edu or um, otherwise you can just come to our offices in the basement of Dirac in uh, room 150.